Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Rubio Luich. I am the Pollen Studio Manager, and I'm so happy to be here with you all today. So energizing and uplifting to see all of your faces. I highly recommend keeping your camera on if you can, and also turning on the grid view in the upper right to see everybody who's here with us today and be in community with each other through the screen. For those of you who may not know much about Pollen, we're a media arts nonprofit dedicated to fostering empathy, encouraging human connection, and inspiring meaningful action. We do that through narrative storytelling and bringing people together. In this unprecedented time in which we've all experienced a complete disruption to our normal way of lives through public health crisis, economic disruption, and physical isolation, We've really been challenged and it's been really hard. And the Pollen team has regularly gathered to check in with each other, ask how each of us are doing, how we're all holding up, um, and really asking ourselves what is Pollen's role during this unprecedented time. Here's what we know. We know that what we do best is create space for people to process the complex issues facing our community, elevate voices that go unheard far too often, and hold our shared humanity at the center of it all. So we have halted all regularly scheduled programming to fully pivot and bring content and gatherings focused on responsive issues connected to this unprecedented time. Every Thursday at 2 p.m., we're hosting these virtual gatherings to hear from guest speakers about their personal experience with the COVID-19 crisis, how they're dealing with increased isolation, how they're making ends meet at a time of economic uncertainty, and how they're building a community of care, even as we're kept apart. This is all a part of our o Are You OK initiative, a collection of stories, art, and connection during these extraordinary times. This is also our small way of being able to directly funnel much needed financial resources to speakers, performers, writers, and artists right now. And if you were with us last week, then you know how important it is to continue supporting our artists and our culture bearers at this time. I'd like to also thank our sponsors and partners. Thank you to the University of Minnesota for their partnership in hosting the technology for today's virtual gathering. Thank you to US Bank Foundation, the Bush Foundation, Team Dynamics, Ide Bailey, and Clifton Larson Allen. Now I'm very excited to introduce our performance for this afternoon, Lot. Lot is the solo project of Minneapolis musician Leah Ottman. Loosely categorized as classical experimental violin, Lott has been exploring songwriting with the personal lens of a former orchestra nerd turned singer, songwriter, and indie musician. One side of her songwriting style draws inspiration from romantic period composers. The violin looping and technical side of her songs have been compared to Andrew Bird and Kishi Bashi, topped with clean alto vocal melodies with melancholy undertones. Please join me in welcoming Lot. I don't, did I unmute, did I unmute myself? Did that work? Okay. I can't hear you all, but that's okay. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is, I go by Lot, um, but this is all casual here. So my name is Leah from regular life. Um, so yeah, I'm going to play some music for you. One moment, sorry, technical difficulty.
sketch a few days ago and then I got an email from Pollen uh, about playing this event and so then I was like okay so I finished it for this event so um so yeah you know I mean I posted it yesterday on Instagram but besides that you were the first to see it I guess performed uh, live so to speak um so anyway so I guess thank you nothing like inspiration to finish something then a deadline so <laughs> Thank you so much, Leah. That was so beautiful. Round of applause for lots, maybe a handshake. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to turn the conversation over to NPR's Laura Ewan, who will introduce our guest speakers. Laura Ewan is editor of the Race, Class, and Communities team at NPR News. She's passionate about stories that expand the narrative of what it means to be a person of color or indigenous person in Minnesota. 
As a reporter, Laura investigated racial inequities ranging from high school graduation rates to traffic stops. She's won several national awards, the most recent of which honored the ethical decisions she faced while covering her company's decision to sever ties with public radio personality Garrison Keillor. Laura loves mentoring younger journalists and co-directs a high school radio camp for students from diverse backgrounds. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Ruby, and thank you to Pollen. I'm um, just so unbelievably honored to moderate this discussion. And I'm really in love with the title of this series, Are You Okay? You know, in journalism, we love to ask really open-ended questions because of the possibilities of where the conversation could go. And I also think that Are You Okay? is a wonderful metaphor for how we should all be checking in on one another during this time of COVID-19. Um, as Ruby mentioned, it's not easy to be dealing with all the stressors during this uncertain time. We're dealing with physical isolation, uh, decreased social connections, the chaos of working from home, sometimes while we're caring for family members, uh, fears of unemployment or dealing with unemployment. Um, and maybe we are already taking care of uh, family members who have gotten unfortunately sick. And on top of that, as Asian Americans, we also might be struggling with the knowledge that we might be targeted in public or online because of the way we look or the color of our skin. So we're gonna get into all of that today, as well as sharing tips for how we can manage this time and how to foster togetherness in a time of isolation, as well as increased hostilities. Um, and we have about a half an hour to dig into this and then we'll take questions from you at the end. So I'm so pleased to introduce our guests. Um, they're really, kick-ass people, and I'm super excited to be able to say that word because I can't say that on the radio. Uh, so first of all, we have Casey Skydy. Casey is a 1.5 generation Philippinex Japanese American, and Casey, whose pronouns are they and them, has been with the SEED Project since June 2016 as a board member, invoking discussions of relational and systemic healing within the Southeast Asian community. Beyond their work with SEED, Casey has been a champion for social justice and student rights, particularly for communities of color within the mental health field of marriage and family therapy, serving for two years as the director of the Student Collaborative with Minnesota Association for Family Therapy, and, and currently serving as a member of the Social Justice Committee. Casey is inspired by the natural beauty and healing power of language. Thanks for being with us, Casey. Janita, um, sorry, I have to get used to the, the delay here. Um, Shanita Pangdara Potter, whose pronouns are she and her, is a Lao American equity advocate, community strategist, narrative storyteller, and mother of two mini monsters. She's the founding executive director and community architect of the SEED project. Welcome, Shanita. And Linda Her, also pronouns she and her, is a writer, poet, and community organizer. Her work and relationships are shaped by her lived experiences as a second generation Hmong American queer feminist. She is the associate executive director, excuse me, of Asian American Organizing Project, a grassroots organization led by and for youth and young Asian Minnesotans with a focus on civic engagement, community organizing and leadership development. Welcome Linda. Okay, so why don't we just get right into it. We're gonna go around the horn and I'm going to ask each of the guests, um, are you okay? So Casey, let's, let's start with you. Are you okay? Well, uh, before I answer that really loaded and open-ended question, I think um, it, this would be a good time to do a grounding exercise. Um, I practiced from a somatic experiencing lens for those of you familiar with that, what that um, entails is uh, I, I tap into the inner wisdom of the body. So our um, connection to not only ourselves, but our ancestors and the people around us. And this is um, particularly helpful in, in, in these types of instances where um, we're isolated, um, both physically and sometimes mentally. So um, if you are able and willing just take a few moments to breathe and notice the breath. Feel free to close your eyes. Notice how the breath 
gives life, brings energy to your arms, your legs, your eyes, and your ears. If you're sitting with your feet firmly on the ground, feel how your feet are touching your clothes, your shoes, penetrating into the earth, connecting to others When you're ready, open your eyes and return to this space. I think it's really important to be intentional in a virtual space, in a space with a lot of energy, a lot of emotion, to be able to, to answer a question like, I am okay. And for me, I'm not okay, um, <laughs> to be frank, um, because there's a lot of things that are going on in my head. I'm worried about my family members who have health conditions. I'm worried for myself, um, my own health. Um, you may notice I, I may pause um, and mute myself. Um, I, uh, I have some trouble breathing sometimes. Um, I, I worry about the, the community that I support, um, the individuals that I, I coach and I um, teach. And I'm also really angry. Uh, I'm angry at myself um, for not doing more. I'm angry at um, our government for not doing more, sometimes both local and, and of course, I, for me, I'm very upset um, with our national government, our federal government. Um, but I'm also very hopeful uh, and I'm very proud of communities and organizations like, like my very own seed project and pollen. Um, I'm grateful for my um, employer. Um, I'm grateful the fact that I'm able to connect with you even if not in, in the way that I prefer it, um, because we are social biological creatures. It's very important for us to have these types of things in person because that's how we process. And it is so difficult to not be able to do that. I still am holding a lot of anxiety right now as, as I'm talking to you where I would normally in, in a face-to-face -face discussion or in a group scenario be able to de-escalate and, and de um, better regulate myself emotionally. But we're here. And I, I'm, I'm very grateful. So I'm feeling a lot of things, but I'm not okay. Thank you. I appreciate your honesty and just being able to say those words, I'm not okay, is there's power in that. Um, Janina, how about you? Are you okay? Yeah. Um... Let's see. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Casey, for joining us. Um, it, it's hard. I think every day, every hour, and every second that passes by, um, it's becoming more and more challenging to answer that question. Um, I pretty much landed into my home um, to quarantine after I deplaned, um, coming back from Southeast Asia via South Korea um, the first week of March. Um, when it all, I, all hell broke loose. Um, so, you know, but my lived experience and being in my home in this space with my mother um, and remembering my resilience uh, story, you know, um, really helps me a lot to remind myself that um, we, we as, um, as refugees, um, my mother and I, um, we have always lived in constant disruption and so it's just a matter of remembering what our ancestors have always taught us about survival, about our well-being, and how to care for one another, um, and, and how it's okay to be vulnerable. Um, there's beauty in that. So I think that, yes, I am both not okay, and I'm also okay, because I'm reminded of where I am, that I'm with family, I'm with community, even um, though we're not physically 
you know, together, but we are socially together, right? So I think um, re reminding and looking at the beauty of that is also um, important. Um, also seeing my children's faces has always reminded me to um, stay resilient and uh, remember that um, that there is there is a tomorrow, right? And that um, that's what we can um, think about. And so, um, yeah, so that, that I guess that's my, my answer too, if I'm okay. Thank you, I love that. There, there definitely is a tomorrow. And Linda, are you okay? Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much, Casey and Chinita. Um, I resonate with you both. Um, I'm not okay. Um, there are some hours, some days that I am okay. Um, and what I've been doing when I'm not okay is having conversations. I think that the more I talk to my family, my partner, uh, my team at work, uh, community like leaders, it helps ground me. It helps me imagine uh, what tomorrow like needs to be done. Um, I think what has really uh, helped me is being able to be truthful with my feelings and my emotions. Uh, being a, a young, you know, Hmong queer woman running an organization with young people who are also uh, supporting or, or that I have to like lead, right? That's a lot of expectations, a lot of um, like support and work that I need to help like my team think through. Um, as well as like with my family, I'm the main person who uh, provides or is the caretaker. And so there's uh, pretty much like my plate is pretty heavy. Um, so for me to be truthful and honest that I'm not okay and that I'm also doing a lot, how do I make time for myself? And so for sure this time I'm being more strict the weekends I'm not doing anything but relaxing and taking care of myself. Um, I think about that there's a lot of like harm and, and like violence that are happening outside or impacting my community as Asian Americans. And there's a sense of feeling like hopelessness of like, what do I do and how do I, how do we approach that? Uh, just because things are happening so fast, uh, you know, COVID was spreading so fast, right? And the violence was also happening so fast and that I can't do anything fast enough to, to address that, right? So of course that plays a role in just the stress and the anxiety um, of community work in, in addition to like personal family work. Um, but my team of young, brilliant people, we've been talking and I wanna just emphasize that conversation has been so helpful to process through this pandemic uh, together so that even though there are times uh, or hours that I don't feel okay or feel powerless that those conversations continue to affirm and guide me and and the people that I'm in community and space with to be able to imagine that this time will pass and this is what we've done. Thank you Linda. Well you definitely touched on some of these horrific stories that are out there and um, sadly, there, there is no shortage. We know of a family in Texas uh, that was knifed in a Sam's, Sam's Club uh, by someone who allegedly believed that they were spreading the virus. Here in Woodbury, Minnesota, there was a Hmong American couple that came home through a racist um, letter left on their, on their door. And my own colleague, H Hannah Yang in South, uh, excuse me, Southern Minnesota, um, was at the grocery store when she overheard an older couple describing her as diseased and suggesting that people like her should be sent back by our president. So this is sadly our reality now. Um, I'm just curious for, for our guests, what is it like to be Asian American in this moment? And how is it different from before COVID-19? Shanita, do you want to start with that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think that we forget um, that racism existed before the pandemic and it exists uh, during this pandemic and it'll exist after this pandemic. So 
Um, I think it's important to re realize that Asian Americans who have historically largely been invisible in terms of what racism means um, is now understanding or beginning to understand that we are not exempt from this experience and we have never been. So I think um, that be because of this, um, you know, it's a very important fact to remember as we think about how now, though, it's much more heightened um, and then anxiety, community anxiety is definitely much more prevalent, right? So I think that uh, one of the realities that I am grappling with and my mother's grappling with is um, that when we leave our homes as Lao American, South Asian, and Asian American is that we are presented with two threats, which is one, racist, uh, attacks from racist or attacks from an aggressive virus, you know, so I think that that's our reality um, and and that's that, that's very hard for us to um, think about what that means, you know, and every time that there is um, some sort of incident um, or any form of violence against Asian Americans that get catapulted into the media, um, we're reminded again um, about how um, this is also very triggering for some of us who have, who come from histories of colonization, uh, violence, war, poverty, right? Um, and so what that tends to happen to our bodies and our soul is we react. So my mother, for example, um, just she'll start cooking and she cooks a lot. It's her form of healing. Um, I think that at first I think of it as a response to trauma, um, which it is but it's also her form of healing. Um, so when I bring up these stories, she'll cook papaya salad, she'll start chopping things up, and then she'll just hand me those plates and she's like, eat, you know, just eat. Um, so I think that they, that I, you know, that, that yes, um, this is all very real. Um, it's also reminding me how we have to remember how we're human first. We hold in each other, how we care for each other. Um, in times like this, that's what they, um, even if we hold and care for each other when others don't do the same. Casey and Lindo, would you like to, to weigh in just on what it's like to be Asian American in this, in this moment? Yeah, I can share. Um, I agree and resonate with everything that Chinia has said. I worry about when my nieces go back to school if the schools are prepared uh, uh, to, to address and support uh, young Asian students, young Asian people. Um, I worry right now with uh, like Asian folks who are employees at their jobs, if they're protected. Um, like, go, you know, we know going out to shopping, there's already been, you know, just a stream of violence uh, uh, on elders or, or, or community members and um, I think it, that Minnesota has done, the state has done a great job in um, um, outreaching and making sure that if Asian folks are experiencing discrimination or harm or violence, that they could report to the um, Department of Human Rights. Um, and so I, like, there's a lot of, like, worries about safety, and, and I do worry. My partner and I, we, when we do make runs to the store to buy, like, food, uh, where we feel a little bit triggered around, oh wait, like, are people looking at us? Um, is, is anyone gonna say anything to us? Uh, so there is that, that, that's, that scare and that, that trigger or that kind of like being like really heightened around how we look like. Um, the other piece too is I've seen um, like Hmong community members or Asian community members on social media, just spewing a lot of anti-blackness um, and that, and that's not okay, right? And I think that our like larger conversation around racial justice, how are we having conversations that um, addresses the complexity and the nuances of, of, of racism? Um, I think that I am like, cons like, I feel like not prepared, right? And I feel like not okay in how that dialogue should happen, um, but I know that it needs to happen. I think that um, there's a lot of, just a lot of like 
verbal like violence out there and I am just like slowly like processing and thinking like in my role around and doing work around racial justice how do I how do I like organize with other people so that we can have a conversation that address that between communities of color indigenous people right in my experience of learning around racial justice it's been very like white centered or binary and that's been really hard for me right in my organizing to to bring in like the uh, xenophobia and, and the violence and racism against Asian communities. Um, I learned about that in schools, but in, you know, more social justice, racial justice space, um, there, there hasn't been that, that room to talk about it. And so for sure, um, racism and xenophobia against Asians uh, have always existed. But I do know now that uh, that that is such an important priority for for me and my my team to to be able to have and and create dialogue. Yeah, I do wonder about that. I mean, just knowing the history of xenophobia in this country. Erica Lee, a professor at the University of Minnesota, has written a book on this. But um, I wonder if knowing the history in some small way can provide comfort and maybe even hope to know that. Um, we've been through some dark chapters in, you know, over the past several hundred years. Um, I, I, oh, I'm sorry, Casey, would you like to also uh, chime in to, I mean, just kind of responding to what we're seeing around us here in the state and in the rest of the country? Yeah, um, sure. I, I, one of the um, things that's on my mind um, regarding the, the healing community and um, clinicians of color and Asian American um, AAPI um, clinicians in particular is I'm, I'm hearing a lot of uh, fear um, and, and uh, of, of being vulnerable with their clients um, at this time. And from the way that I see that, um, that's a hindrance to um, practicing ethically um, and being uh, fully present with the clients and, and community. And um, I will say it, it, it's, it's been a struggle um, in, in terms of um, practitioners right now, um, getting the guidance that they need, um, which is really heartbreaking for me to hear um, to my colleagues and peers that they're not feeling supported um, so if you know any um, Asian American uh, healers out there, please reach out to them. Um, and uh, I, I for, for myself, um, you know, it, just going out um, has, has been a struggle for the past couple of years, since 2016, to, to be honest. Um, particularly for me, um, Orlando was kind of the, the most triggering um, moment uh, in my life. Um, as a darker uh, skinned Filipino person. Um, and I, I, I feel like last year was kind of the first, 2019 was the year that I, I finally felt comfortable being in my skin again um, and, and being able to walk down the street um, in Minneapolis. I've, I've experienced um, this discrimination based upon my you know, race as well as my sexuality and um, just, Hearing um, all of these stories again, it, it, it is so, it, it, my mind just goes through what is called a trauma vortex. And there's so many thoughts and emotions that come back. Um, and and that's that same sort of um, experience that I'm hearing in my colleagues. Um, and um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling right now because um, just being present because I'm, I'm, I'm worried um, for, for the health of, of my colleagues and, and my community. Um, yeah, I'm glad you said that too. And to know that there's even a term for it, I think you said it was a trauma vortex um, because it seems like uh, when, when this does happen to you, if, if you are accosted um, verbally or otherwise, you know, about your race, it can really bring up a whole flood of traumatic experiences um, through the course of your life. So I think um, it's, worth, it's worth noting just how, how harmful these one-off comments can be. 
Um, you know, Linda, you, you are a community organizer, and I'm just wondering if there are any skills or muscles that you can kind of flex and share with the rest of us in terms of how you might draw strength in a time like this. Yes, of course. So my team and I, we, uh, when this happened, we uh, knew immediately that we needed wellness buddies, right? And what wellness buddy is uh, having someone who you usually check in at the end of the day of work or life um, or every other day that, that makes sense to you. Um, and just being able to be explicit around like, how do I feel right now? Uh, what do I need to address um, what I'm feeling right now? Um, so it could be as simple as like, I haven't drank water all day. And so I need to drink water. There's also a form of like really like accountability with each other, right? To take it, taking care of each other. Um, so that has been working really well for my team and us. Um, I've also in that organizing like work mode, I take that back home, right? So it doesn't just work in, in, in workplaces, right? But taking that back to also teach and, and create a, a routine of checking in and wellness with my family members so that it doesn't get really exhausting, right? If uh, if you or like me, who is the caretaker, um, having to like check in on everybody, right? But that also enables other folks to be checking in with you so that you can feel like some relief or assurance that folks are doing okay. Um, I think that in, you know, in my experience of being queer and being Hmong and being a woman, um, I've like endured uh, just struggles and challenges of survival, um, of coming out, of, of feeling like I'm the only gay mom girl in the world um, in the late 90s to early 2000s and having to leave home from St. Paul to like San Francisco and back home, right? Um, I've uh, survived that uh, traumatic experience to becoming more stronger and for sure art uh, and writing and processing has been very therapeutic and really grounding um, and has also guided the conversations that I have with uh, the, the people in the community around me. Um, and so art, you know, has been very helpful for me. I listen to music uh, when I go to sleep to help me sleep. Um, and, and for sure, uh, coordination, collaboration with like key people, right, who are interested in, for example, um, doing youth mental health, uh, health wellness care, right? Being able to do thought partner or strategic or creative uh, uh, work with people who are working directly or people who are impacted by in, in that area has, has also enabled me to feel powerful that we can do something right now. We're not powerless. Uh, so for sure, like the youth and young people um, that I work with, uh, is really uh, has really grounded me. And I, before I forget, uh, Linda, a few minutes ago, you did mention, you know, the ability to report these crimes or, um, you know, acts of discrimination. And just a few days ago, the state of Minnesota, in collaboration with groups like Cal, um, did create a toll free helpline. It's at 1 833 454 0148. And folks can Google it if. Um, if they're interested in having that on file for themselves or for loved ones. Um, Casey, what, what does taking care of yourself look like in this time? And, and what needs do you see in the Asian American community and how we might be able to help each other, one another? Good question. Um, and I, I, I resonate um, what, with what Linda um, was saying and, and what I heard her saying is that she's very intentional um, and I, I, I myself am very intentional in how I approach my, my self-care um, and, and just my, my general health. I think a, a lot of um, what we're doing right now is exactly what self-care is to me. It's being intentional around coming, uh, around, um, coming together, around talking about how we are experiencing this together um, you know, and, 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 and connecting it to um, what's important to us um, intentionally. Uh, for me, um, 
I feel like a, a lot of uh, like a lot of people in our community cooking um, in particular. Um, I love making skinny gang. That's my my soul food. That's that that's what brings me home. Um, if you, those of you are not familiar with uh, that lovely uh, soup, um, it's um, tamarind based. It's a little a little sour, um, very um, umami, um, sometimes pork or uh, shrimp based. Um, but I, I can <laughs> go into detail about uh, just how much that, that dish in particular um, brings me so much pleasure um, and so much warmth. Um, while uh, I'm not getting into that, but um, <laughs> food is really important and, and listening to the body in particular, you know, being mindful of um, the amount of water that you intake, making sure that you stand up, make sure that you, you can actually feel the parts of, of your body um, that are there, which means all of them, um, you know, and if there, there are any pain points, understanding, um, trying to come with a sense of curiosity of like, what's going on? Why? Why do I have a headache right now? Why do, why do I feel so sad? Um, for me, when I um, get out of a session or um, I'm finished with a very intensive conversation, I often feel really tired, especially in these um, virtual spaces because so much focus um, is placed on making sure I communicate in a way that you're understanding where I'm coming from. Um, and so, you know, I, again, like intentionality is, 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 is the key in this and, and being intentional about stepping away as well is, is really important. Um, as far as um, what the Asian American community can do, or the, the community in general is focusing on, on yourself in, in that regard, being very mindful of the space um, that you, the spaces that you're in, um, because there is, is so much heightened um, anxiety and, and grief um, and a whole host of other emotions and, uh, and feelings, it's important to be able to figure out first um, what is within you to be able to navigate those spaces. Thank you. Well, uh, it is time to open it up for questions. And uh, I just want to encourage you to um, use the chat function so we can ask our awesome seekers here uh, to answer them. Let's see. OK, open question to any panelist comes from Paku Lee. What are some best practices or starting points for working with college age Asian and Asian American students during this time? I, I can answer that. This is Linda. Um, for sure, checking in with uh, college students to see how, um, like, having everything online, is, you know, learning has been. Um, also, checking in if there are financial needs or support that they may have. I, um, some of our fellows had said that their uh, their funding has been cut, like reduced. Right. And so, but this, there's tuition still the same. And so checking on like college students basic needs and where, how, what can we do to support um, as well as are there resources or so, like support uh, available for them. Um, I would also say that that goes the same to high school students. Um, but for sure, we need to be checking on our youth and young people. Uh, because, you know, moving everything to online learning, right, is, it can be really hard and challenging, especially if they don't have like the laptops or the internet connection um, or a, like a household where they feel uh, comfortable and good to do studying in. Um, so I, I do know that some students are struggling uh, because it might be a little bit more harder to, to do everything by yourself online, right? So being able to check in on what the uh, students' needs are. We have a lot of students who are transplants who might not have that kind of support system here in Minnesota. So another good reason why we should be reaching out to them. Um, you know, I have a question. You know, one thing that Hannah said in her essay, which um, was published on, on NPR's website, Hannah was my colleague who was, um, who had that awful experience in the grocery store, she said something to the effect of, I wish somebody who heard 
you know, this couple uh, denigrate me. I wish someone would have said something and came to my defense. And I'm just curious, what can people do if, if uh, you know, no matter what race you are, if you do see somebody who is the subject of, of a racist rant or whatnot, what would you like bystanders to do or say? Yeah, I, you know, I, um, my mother also experienced something at the grocery store, and so I can also empathize with what Hannah went through. And, what happened? Oh, well, she's like, yeah, people were, she's like, these um, white people were giving me way too much room. Is that normal? And I'm like, oh, well, probably not. And then she said, they said a few things. And, and then when she asked them what they said, um, she, um, they, they, they said, it's okay, you don't speak English. And so it just kind of got into this other thing. And so, um, but yeah, I think that one of the things that I want to be, uh, want to have folks to be aware of who are non self I'm sorry, non-Asian American is also, um, just anyone in the community is that, um, you know, checking in with, um, you know, your fellow Asian American neighbors, whether it's in workspaces or community spaces, et cetera, is, is also a great starting point, you know, just checking in with them. How are you doing? Asking them, are you okay? Um, and offering um, anything, whether it's a phone call, can I call you? Can I go get your groceries? You know, um, can I go pick up things for you? Um, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite stories coming back was I had to be quarantined. My whole family had to be quarantined for about two weeks um, before there was a shelter in place that forced us to stay home for another couple of weeks was I had an outpouring of support from incredible community members who came to drop off food and activities for my kids at the door. Um, and it was just amazing, you know, and so I think that those are the little action steps that anybody could do to just show love, to share resources, to, to show that you care, you know, is the very first step. But also, um, I also don't want us to escape from the fact that, you know, um, having healing centered spaces to help um, um, comfort and support Asian Americans isn't the only place, but that you yourself should also be taking action, seeking out when you see it happen um, making sure that if you see some at the grocery store, um, you're, you're witnessing, um, you know, any sort of form of racism against Asian Americans, say something, you know, do something. Um, I think that anything to just be like, hey, that's not okay, you know, um, and, 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 and reporting it and telling somebody in the store is also helpful. I think a lot of Asian Americans, especially our elders who do have to be in these spaces, and like my mother who may not know how to speak English well, uh, usually her reaction is she just brushes it off. Oh, it's another day. Don't, don't worry about it, you know. But um, it's also the good Asian narrative. So she's always be like, oh, I've had worse. It's okay, you know. But then it's also like, no, it's not okay. So being um, completely intolerant of any form of it, whether it's physical or verbal, just should not be tolerated. And people need to really stand up and just say, no, that's not okay for you to do that. Um, because um, I think one of the, the stigmas in our communities, especially in Asian American communities, is um, our mental well-being. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to hear about it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, th those are things that we need to be reminded of, that there are things that we can do and say, and we should definitely say them. I don't think we should be waiting until something happens to their safety. Uh, we had some other questions. Are there organizations in addition to the SEED Project and Asian American Organizing Project that funders should be supporting to support AAPI community members now? And when will when we all begin to emerge? Any national organizations you'd recommend? And someone did chime in with the Coalition of Asian American Leaders here in Minnesota. Yeah, there was a joint letter that Linda and I also, maybe we can um, oh. share that, right? That also has 25 or so organizations yep. on there. Okay, yep. yeah, thank you. And Julie did chime in with that too. 26 plus Asian allied or um, Asian Americans. Um, Linda, do you want to chime in? Yeah, so Asian Americans Advancing Justice, mm -hmm. uh, they have different chapters that do uh, legal support work and policy work. And so they do have a national 
uh, reporting uh, page since 20, after the 2016 elections when a lot of anti-refugee immigrant rhetorics and violence were happening. Um, even though there is that page, there's also some um, streamlining, right, around data sharing or coordination that still needs to be uh, better uh, uh, discussed. Uh, therefore, um, it, it, we also found that it would be best if like different states in geography also um, like address that. So like the 26 plus local organizations here, we're working with like the government, the Department of Human Rights to uh, figure out how to report it. Uh, and then having conversations to see are there, what are the data that are coming in and how do we address that? So there's a component of like the legal stuff as well as the more community conscious raising and advocacy work that several uh, of our organizations um, are doing. And so if you all sign up or sign on to the link that Julie has sent, uh, we will send you more information on just how to get involved and what next steps could be. Like 30 seconds left. Um, this question comes from Laura. I'm an adjunct professor. How do I support my international students from Asia who are dealing with racism on top of all the other stressful stuff? Grad school, culture shock, social, social distancing. Some of them have been in the U.S. less than a year. Does anyone want to take that one and make it snappy? <laughs> um, I can. Um, so I, I, I work within a um, post-secondary setting uh, with graduate learners um, at the doctoral level. So one of the things that I um, focus on, um, this may not um, focus on what they're experiencing in terms of, of racism, but I think in terms of um, grounding them and being able to be control of the things that they can control. Um, so one of the terms that I talk about um, with uh, my learners or students is uh, locus of control. So what sorts of things are within your frame of control. So, you know, um, for example, for myself, I have an apartment to go home to or live in and, and um, sleep in. I know that I have a check um, to be able to pay for things and kind of having them um, do an inventory with, um, with you um, in whatever particular uh, topic area that they're interested in. But, um, I, I would just allow them to um, kind of say what's on their mind and be be coming with um, be coming to that conversation with a sense of curiosity that help them frame um, just what what is um, what they're able to control in, in their life um, within that setting would probably be um, the the most ideal um, in 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 that role and capacity. Okay. Thank you so much, Casey, Linda, and Tanita. We really appreciate just um, the vulnerability, but also the huge amount of insight that you have shared with all of us today. I'm going to hand it back to Ruby for closing remarks. Oh, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Thank you so much, Laura and uh, the entire panel, Casey, Shanita, and Linda, for being here with us. These conversations were so powerful and so needed, and I feel so honored to have shared this time with all of you. So thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask you all to stay tuned for just a few more minutes. I do have some important announcements to share, but the first thing that I want to do is send some love to Pollen's executive director, Jamie Millard, and her family. Um, Jamie has been taking care of her family this week after her one-year-old was hospitalized a little earlier this week. So I just wanna take a moment to say from all of us, um, from the pollen team to the entire pollenite community, our hearts, our minds, our thoughts are with Jamie and her baby Danny and the entire Millard family and we love you. A uh, few other announcements. I want to quickly highlight that pollen events normally cost around $35 a ticket, but these gatherings are and will continue to be free. So we're asking that you each consider a donation at any size in lieu of the usual ticket price. We're also asking our pollen community to please support today's featured artists in whatever way you're able to 
We'll be sharing links to do so through social media here in the chat and in the follow up email you'll receive after today's event. And one more call to action. If you have the capabilities, please reach out to two to three people and set up a way to connect with them. It can be coworkers, family, friends, neighbors, anyone you want to connect with. Ask these same questions as a way to start the conversation and use the hashtag RUOKMN. We'll be sending a follow-up email with resources and links that will include a recording of today's virtual gathering, which you'll be able to share with others. And please join us next Thursday at 2 p.m. for our next gathering. Don't forget to read our most recently published piece, which I saw Julie also share in the chat a little bit earlier. It has an amazing recipe um, and kind of built on some of the sentiments that were shared from our panel today. So thank you all for being here. Stay healthy and connected. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Be safe. Don't get to wash your hands and wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs>